This Week in Virology, the podcast about viruses, the kind that make you sick. This Week in Virology, episode number 91, recorded on July 16th, 2010. Hey everybody, it's Vincent Racaniello, and this is TWIV, your weekly dose of viruses. Today we got a great crew returning after a long absence, Dixon Despommiers. Hey Vince. Good to have you back. Nice to be back. I missed you. Oh, same here. All right. Next, we have from Western Massachusetts, Alan Dove. Good to be back. Welcome. Yes, and uh, good to hear Dick on the line, too. Yeah, he hasn't been here in a while. Yeah. Hmm. No, he just left. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> he did not. No, moving, he's still here. Moving down the coast to north central Florida is uh, Rich Condit. Hello, everybody. Hey, Rich, you see any uh, globs of oil? <laughs> uh, not yet. Of course, uh, if the, if we get globs of oil in Gainesville... Yeah, um, then you're like in 75 really, miles from the coast. I'm in, leaving. You're in deep yogurt. Deep <laughs> yogurt, that's right. <laughs> and our special guest today, moving back up the coast in the same state as Alan Dove, huh. is Welkin Johnson. Welcome to TWIV. Hello. It's great to be here. Yeah. Oh, in my office talking to you. <laughs> <laughs> yes. We're never all here. Well, Dixon's with me here in my office. He is. Welkin is an assistant professor in the Department of Microbiology and Molecular Genetics at Harvard Medical School, which, of course, is in Boston, MA. Not too far from you, Alan. Uh, a couple of hours. Guys have never met, I presume. An right? hour, hour drive, I guess. No, no, we haven't met. I don't think so. And we got Wel Welkin here today to talk about endogenous retroviruses, hmm. something that is always thought-provoking and seems to be of interest to everybody. He's also an associate blogger, by the way, at Small Things Considered. Oh, nice. Which we picked a long time ago, way at the beginning of TWIV. It was a pick of the week. How does that work, Welkin? It's uh, the blog. Yeah, do you write so... whenever you want or you get solicited? <laughs> <laughs> oh, so it's the brainchild of Elio Schechter, who was uh, a chair of microbiology at Tufts, and I was fortunate enough to overlap with him I think my first or second year of graduate school, he was still the chair. He was a president of ASM, and he went into retirement, but he's kind of like you guys. He can't really seem to stop, so he keeps teaching. Right. Uh, he moved out to San Diego. He teaches, I think, at uh, Cal State. He taught in Mexico, and he keeps writing books on things like uh, mushrooms and fungi and bacteria. And hmm. So he loves all all kinds of microbiology, and so he set up that... Uh, the blog together with a woman named Mary Yule, and they run it together. And uh, he tapped me <laughs> with the job of making sure that viruses were better represented on the blog. And I'm, <laughs> I'm not sure I've done an, uh, enough of that yet. I've, I've done a couple of posts, and I need to get back to work at it. Nice. Yeah, it's got a good audience. But I definitely, I recommend it to that. I think the listeners of your show would really like that blog, actually. Yeah. yeah uh, they, we... Oh, we could use it as a pick of the week. We have to do pick another a, we pick have of the week. <laughs> another yes. the pick of the last. Well, okay, we can pick it again. <laughs> pick it every week. They do a great thing called the Talmudic questions. Yeah. Where they yes. Post a sort of a thought provoking question like, "Can what if tomorrow you woke up and there were no bacteria on the planet? What would happen? Oh, yeah. Or can you think of an organism that doesn't have a virus?" The Irish and, would be very very upset with that. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's a good question. What would happen if you woke up and there were no viruses? No viruses. Hmm. You know, David Baltimore has made the statement, and I'd be interested to hear your opinion on this, Welkin. He said if, if the viruses disappeared, no one would notice. Oh, I don't agree with that. I don't yeah, think no. so. I don't I think so. I don't agree with that one. Yeah. I don't know if I want to go on record disagreeing with David Baltimore. <laughs> I, I will. I'm retired. <laughs> I think David's a great thinker, but I think that David is not a... Uh, he doesn't uh, consider the ocean, for instance, as a genetic soup. Yeah. And the genetic soup of the ocean is being controlled largely by viruses that infect algae and bacteria and all kinds of other well, wildlife, as it were. Mm -hmm. I, I think if we get into the endogenous viruses a bit today, we, we, there's some evidence there that they probably played a very big role in the evolution of animal species sure. of all kinds. Sure. I would believe so. That. With, you know, I guess we'll talk about it, but I guess it's ongoing still, right? Yeah, 
I think so. All right, so let's before we talk about herbs, endogenous retroviruses, which have given rise to many, many potential titles, by the way. Um, tell us where you got started. Where are you where are you brought up in the Northeast or somewhere else? Uh, me? Yeah. So I uh, kind of all over the place. I've um, I hate to point this out, but I've lived in a lot of the same places as the Unabomber. I was born in Michigan, actually. So the both sides of the family come from Michigan. But then um, uh, between then and California, uh, my family lived in uh, Chicago area for a while. And then in Montana. And we finally wound up out on the West Coast by the time I started high school. Um, and so then I grew up mostly in California. And then I came out to Massachusetts. Where, where in California? Uh, Monterey. Okay. So Northern California, maybe two hours south of San Francisco. Nice. Right. Um, a lot of scientists might know it because the Asilomar Conference Center is there. Sure. And the Marine I used Biology to hang, Station. I used to hang out at Hopkins Marine Station. Oh, yeah. Ah, uh, right. I John, have John Steinbeck made that place pretty famous, too. Yep. yep. Yeah, you can actually, there's a Steinbeck Museum there. Mm -hmm. um, and so then I, I came out to Massachusetts to go to graduate school in 91, and I'm just now accepting the fact that I'm not moving back to California. <laughs> Where did you go to grad school? Uh, so I went to graduate Tufts. school at uh, Tufts Medical School. I was a graduate student in John Coffin's lab in the micro nice. department there. And how long ago was that, if you don't mind me asking? So I, that was 91 to 97, I did think. Did you know Jerry Kirsch by any chance? Uh, no. no. Or um, Shelley Wolf. Um, I probably didn't know many people. <laughs> Most of us graduate students, I understand. <laughs> so you, where did you postdoc? Uh, so then I, I went to the New England Primate Center, and I postdoc oh, Ron yeah. Rozier. Ah, yes, Ron oh. Rozier. Well, I had a great chat with years ago in Geneva. Uh -huh. about, about vaccines? Yeah, you know, he's always been interested in HIV vaccines, right? Yep. So we talked about polio vaccines. Uh you know, over lunch or something in Geneva, jet lagged, but he always—it <laughs> was a great conversation. It's one of those spontaneous things. I think Ron might be a good uh, yes guest for your show. I I agree. Talk about but, some of the history there. Yeah. So you did when you were postdoc, and I'm sorry, not postdoc, but um, your your PhD with John Coffin. That's when you worked on herbs, right? That's right. That's right. That's when I got interested in them. And I I think mm. I think we should talk about them and. Your work that you're doing now is great, and I don't know if we'll get to it, but... Oh, it's okay. I would... Uh, <laughs> I get to talk about that all the time. Vince, we've got to talk about it. Come on, if it's great. It's great, but we'll have oh. him back. Oh, okay. Yeah, sure. Because if you, like uh, if you are not too abused on this episode... <laughs> it's it's going to take us an hour to talk about herbs. I if think. you yes. dare, if you dare, come back. And, uh, I'm a I, scientist. Uh, I'm used to abuse. I'd love to have you back. <laughs> <laughs> no, no, your, your SIV trim story... <laughs> I think that could make an episode in its own. So let's see. I mean, if we only spend five minutes on herbs, then that's it. But uh, tell us what an herb is. Uh, so an herb. So I, I knew you were going to ask that question. <laughs> so you uh, looked it up. <laughs> yeah. I'm looking it up right now. Oh, great. No. Uh, so I, I think um, so that the conversation goes more smoothly down the road, I think it's always uh, worth taking a few minutes to define this really well. I found in the past, if you don't, do that up front, there's a lot of confusion. And so I would, I would start by just, so, so to bring all your listeners kind of up, on, up to speed and get them on the same page, um, first, they just need to know a little bit of basic retrovirology. And the, the ones who've done the, the Virology 101 podcast, of course, will remember this. But uh, retroviruses are, have an RNA genome, a single-stranded RNA genome. And when they infect a host target cell, the first thing they do is convert that RNA into DNA, and then they insert the DNA copy of their genome, mm. uh, more or less at random, into the chromosomal DNA of the target host cell. Uh, and so then the target host cell now has acquired this extra piece of DNA, and it's sitting there on a chromosome along with several thousand other genes. Uh, all those other genes, of course, produce proteins and factors that the cells use for their own purposes, uh, whereas the retroviral DNA, the DNA provirus, we call it, um, is essentially a gene that drives the expression of more retroviral virions that then pop out of the cell and go on to infect the next cell. So, so that DNA provirus is kind of the hallmark of retroviral replication. It's a, it becomes a permanent part of the, of the host cell chromosome. All right, so that, 
That's the retrovirology you need to know. So then if we go back to the question, what is an endogenous retrovirus or an ERV? Uh, an ERV, well, let's start. If, if you go to look at the genome sequence of, of probably any animal species, you, an insect or a marsupial, a pig or a person, uh, what you'll find in the genome sequences are tens or even hundreds of thousands of DNA sequences that look for all the world like a DNA provirus, as if though a retrovirus infected and, and deposited the provirus there. Um, but then that raises the question is how did the DNA provirus get there? Right? Most retroviruses we study infect T cells or B cells or liver cells or some cell and tissues in the body. Um, so how did a DNA provirus wind up into the germline? And what must have happened uh, in every case is that a retrovirus uh, during the course of infecting an organism or an individual somehow managed to infect a germline cell. So it infected a, a spermatocyte or an oocyte, or maybe even more likely it infected a, a developmental precursor to a sperm or an oocyte. And so what happens then is the DNA provirus in that case is getting deposited into the DNA of a cell that will be used to create the next generation. That's the DNA that gets passed on uh, to, the, to the offspring of the infected individual. And so now you have a DNA provirus that's become essentially the same as an inherited gene. It can be passed on uh, through the generations um, in that fashion. So that's the thing that we call an endogenous retrovirus. And the, the term sometimes causes confusion because we're not really talking about a virus. We're talking about a viral sequence. So every you said every mammal or any animal will have an endogenous retrovirus? I, I think almost every genome that you can look at mm -hmm. will have thousands, uh, thousands of them, actually. So, say the human genome, how many? Uh, the thousands? estimates that I've read are maybe 400, 500,000 things that look like they were probably at one time retroviral sequences. So what percent would that be, roughly? I've heard numbers up yeah, to 40%, the, but I don't know if that's right. Well, the so 40%, I think, is all-encompassing. That would include retrotransposons, line elements, signs, and things like okay. that. The things that would look uh, specifically like retroviruses are more like 8 or 9%. Okay. Uh, even that's a big number. So that's a few, lot. It's a huge. People, that's yeah. a lot. You yeah. spend a lot of energy replicating that stuff for no reason, apparently. A few people have pointed out that that actually <laughs> exceeds the amount of DNA that's devoted to coding genes. That's incredible. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Do you want us uh, to believe this? Come on. <laughs> I just came back to this show. <laughs> I find myself back where I started. I don't know anything. You know, it's one of those tidbits that to really get to the heart of it, you'd have to go back through. You, you've been through this, right? You see it stated in a paper. You go look at the citation. You look up the citation. The citation cites another paper. Right. right. Um, no and I haven't worked my way all the way back through that chain yet, but I... Uh, I have grown to believe the number. Wow. <laughs> so in, um, in in any of these species where there is proviral, endogenous retroviral DNA, is any of it produce virus? Uh, yeah, yeah, actually it does. Um, you know, they were probably best studied in things like chickens and mice, which were the the model organisms for studying retroviruses through most of the 20th century. Um, and so mice definitely have intact loci that express infectious uh, retrovirus from endogenous sequences. But humans do not produce the virus, right? Uh, so, f so far, no one has, has come across a human locus that produces virus, no. Okay. Almost all of the ones that you would look at in humans, um, you can tell by looking at the DNA sequences themselves that they're defective in some way. Uh, they'll have large deletions or point mutations, stop codons in the middle of genes. And do any of them look like things that we know about already? Look Even like, though they're missing certain parts, could you identify which virus that might have come from? Um, most of them, actually, I'd have to, all of them, no. No, no probably all of them are extinct, represent extinct species of retrovirus in the human genome. Mm -hmm. um, there are some sort of phylogenetic similarities, but there's nothing, say, that, that's clearly derived from HIV-1, for example. But that's why you're calling them retroviruses rather than something else. Oh, yeah, they definitely look like retro. They're clearly retroviruses. Okay. There's no question. Okay. Some of them actually do express, like there are um, expressed uh, RNAs are sometimes picked up, and there's some mm. tissues that will mm. spontaneously produce viral-like particles, but as mm. far as we know, they're not infectious. Now, so, presumably so, some of these we inherited from 
prior ancestors of humans, and maybe some have shown up just in the human lineage? That's that's absolutely true. Um, so, so, for example, if you go in and compare human and chimpanzee genomes, you can quite find quite a few uh, where the exact same provirus is sitting in exactly the same spot in chimp and human that's genome. That's remarkable. And so, yeah, and so that means that that one infectious event happened in a common ancestor of chimps and humans. Some some uh, ancestral primate was walking around with a with a raging retroviral infection, and one of the virions got into its germline, and now every single human has a copy of that provirus. And, and then the we other... also have we also have more recent integrations too, right? Yeah, there's um there's a family, especially a family called Herv K, which seems to have a number of integrations that are thought to be more recent because they're not fixed in humans. Um, that is, there are some humans that have them and some that don't, and they so, also they also look more intact. They're they're they only have a few inactivating mutations. So, so how recent probably, is that? Okay. How recent is that? Yeah. Um, you know, uh, I don't remember the estimates, but you know these these things um, they're usually based on molecular clock estimates, and so they uh, based on a rate of sequence evolution. Um, and so they'll say something like a couple hundred thousand years, give or take a couple hundred thousand years. <laughs> <laughs> right. But probably sometime in the last million years. Sometime wow. between yesterday and uh, <laughs> That's when right, we were the dawn of uh, East Africa. Yeah, the chordates. Exactly. I, I also want to ask whether or not any of these have turned up in the Neanderthal genome because I know they're now busy sequencing that whole thing. I'm dying to know that. Yeah. I'm dying to know yeah. that. I have a graduate student who's... who's uh, I think has made a few attempts to try and access that data and find mm -hmm. out. Um, you know, Neanderthals are not that far back, right? So it might be that there, you, right. there might be no differences. But, but they did evolve out of before. Africa separately from us, and uh... I guess that yeah, they are saying that. So maybe they brought a different. Um, you know, actually, yeah, the, you would expect there to be some differences, right? The, um, so th this is a process that probably started shortly after there was life and has been going on ever since. The process of endogenizing endogenizing retroviruses. I mean, if it's in everything, um, yes. <laughs> it's, yeah. it's quite uh, amazing. It's amazing that it almost seems um, counterintuitive when you think about how much energy we expend just to replicate our molecules. It seems that all this extra baggage that does nothing supposedly would be discarded sometime by an energetics model. And yet we've continued to carry these things forward for a long, long time. Uh, any way to reconcile those two ideas? Yeah. I, well, I think there's there's two answers to the question. They're not exclusive answers. I think um, what you're asking is why do we still have them? Yeah. Um, and what I favors think, they're, they're being uh, around still? So the question, is, it's kind of like asking why do we still have an appendix? Oh, uh, I think we so. did answer that one. I think we did answer it. I think no, I'm not kidding. The answer to that one is very simple. The moment you get diarrheal disease, all your gut flora disappears except in your appendix. Oh, okay. And so that I, receives... I can't use the appendix. No, you can't use anymore. that bottle <laughs> anymore. Your wisdom teeth. Pick something else. <laughs> so that's kind of like asking why do we still have wisdom teeth? <laughs> Good. Good, that's better. I like that much better. <laughs> you see how much fun we can have on this show without going anywhere. <laughs> Uh, <laughs> all right. I'm, I'm sorry. I, I don't get to was, no, make light um, of this. I know it's a serious subject. So, so actually, the answer is we're probably getting rid of them all the time. So okay. it's, it's important to remember that all the DNA sequences we have are really one time point. We have DNA sequences for organisms uh, currently living on planet Earth in the 21st century. And so that's just a snapshot. And probably, if you go look at these things, they're they're clearly in the process of degrading. Uh, they're acquiring plant mutations, deletions. They're essentially decaying uh, due to the same processes that sort of turn over junk DNA in our genomes. Um, we're probably acquiring new ones as we go along too, but the whole thing happens on an evolutionary time scale. Um, so you don't really see it happening. I think that the, the most um, obvious thing that you can see in genomes is um, solo LTRs, uh, and I know you've explained LTRs on the show before, right. but just to recap, LTRs are the, at the ends of the DNA provirus, there's about 500 to 1,000 base pairs that are identical at both ends, 
Uh, and so what can happen is you can get homologous recombination between the LTRs and looping out of the sequence in between. Hmm. Essentially, um, so the genome will spit out sort of the internal retroviral genes and leave behind a solo LTR. And so if you go and look at uh, human genomes or other animal genomes, uh, solo LTRs in many cases will outnumber actually intact proviruses. So it's probably one of the more common mechanisms by which these things are gotten rid of. So we are constantly getting rid of them, but we're also constantly getting new integration events. Yeah, I think that's probably the case. But, um, but there are not any new ones that we would know about right now because it's too recent. Right, it's too recent. Right. 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 It would take. It would have to be a process. You know, if a new herb formed, say, in a HIV-infected individual, right. and they happen to pass that chromosome on, it could take thousands of generations sure. for that chromosome yeah. to spread throughout the gene. So there could be one person walking around with a HIV a genome in its germline, right? That Oop. sounds like a great idea for a science fiction. <laughs> <laughs> I have another question that might have already been answered <laughs> because I wasn't listening carefully enough, probably. But how far down the phylogenetic tree of life do you have to go before you don't find these in the genomes of those organisms? Um, you know, I don't think there's anything that looks like a retrovirus in in um, bacteria, for example. Okay. But there's definitely uh, retrovirus-like things in insects, for example. Right. So Drosophila have these, um, it's kind of interesting, they're gypsy elements, they look like retro elements, but they have that third open reading frame that looks like an envelope protein, right. which would make them a virus. Uh, and gypsy, there's some data out there now that says that spread of it in Drosophila is controlled by another gene that's nicely named Flamenco. Hmm. That, that might be an interesting story for the, huh. uh, for the show sometime. So what about fungi? Fungi are the next level up from bacteria, so to speak? Uh... Nothing there. No, I'm not sure about that. I thought there, there, was, about something thought there was something in yeast. Yeah. Uh -huh. Oh yeah, there's TY elements. Um, okay. I see. So, so if you define it loosely, if you mm. include retrotransposons, then then you're going to find them almost everywhere. How about that, plants? Plants. Um, yes, I think so. There are things in plants that look like retroviruses. You know, a lot of these things haven't been studied at all. So you're calling them that based mm. purely on looking at a sequence. A couple of episodes ago, we talked about the work of Paul Binash, which I'm sure you know, where he reconstituted one of the endogenous yeah, that was, uh, that was his student, Nam, I yeah. think, did that work. So he said that one family of herbs, human herbs, uh, may have re replicated in human ancestors uh, less than one million years ago. So that would be the most recent, maybe? Uh, yes. So that that's would the, be, I think those were Herb K. Right, Herf K, and that's what we mean when the most recent mm -hmm. insertion, yeah. You know, that um, there was um, there was actually a second group that did that about the same time. So Thierry Heidemann's group in France also had a, a similar mm -hmm. paper. Um, and what was kind of neat about their paper is they named the resurrected uh, Herf K, they named it Phoenix. <laughs> of course. Right. <laughs> which was kind of neat. The name didn't seem to catch on, but I always liked that. Well, I was thinking of... Uh, Naming that episode, you know, something Phoenix, but oh yeah, but we called it an undead retrovirus. The, the <laughs> like birth the of the undead. <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> so you had said, yeah, I guess you covered this. You had said in your uh, voicemail that you sent us uh, about a month ago that we're losing these very rapidly. Therefore, eventually, if no one, no new ones came into our genomes, and assuming that the human race lives long enough, they would all disappear. You think? Assuming I said that? No, no, I'm asking you. You had said that they are disappearing. Oh, you, if we didn't acquire any new ones, yeah. would, and they would, all disappeared. Would they all go? Or do they do something that helps us? Oh, well, yeah. So I think a lot of them would probably eventually either go or they would acquire so many mutations they weren't the original virus anymore. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, you know, like the story of George Washington's axe, right? Tell us. <laughs> They'd say they have the original, George Washington's original axe, except the blade has been replaced seven times and the handle's been replaced five times. <laughs> right. um, John the Baptist's forefinger. <laughs> <yeah>. <laughs> we won't tell you where we found that either. Yeah, no, um, don't. <laughs> But okay, so um, this suggests but, that if we were to escape from this planet, as we all want to seem to want to do for whatever reasons, 
that in X number of generations from now, living on Mars will have a completely different genome based on the loss of retroviral sequences that can no longer come in because we're in a totally different environment. Yes, but but I suppose what the other thing you're driving at is is whether some of these things would actually be actively maintained by natural selection. Right. Whether, and, and that's definitely... It's a small fraction, and it, well, actually, I guess we don't really know how many of them. It's hard to study it in mm-hmm. humans, but there are some really, uh, there's actually some really neat examples. The the um, there's sort of two kinds of examples, and the the best documented kinds are where endogenous retrovirus sequences have been co-opted uh, by the host, uh, sort of and turned against uh, other viruses. So, so the best examples come from mice. So, there, for example, there's a gene called FV4. It was first defined genetically uh, in mice as a genetic locus that conferred resistance uh, to exogenous infection by viruses like murine leukemia virus. Um, and then finally, I think in the 1980s, a couple of different groups finally mapped and cloned the gene. Um, that would be, I think it was Murray Gardner was one of the groups, and I forget the other one. Um, I think it was a, a Rapaski. Uh, and the gene itself turns out to be the envelope protein of an endogenous retrovirus. And so what probably happens is expression of that envelope protein uh, acts sort of in a dominant negative fashion to prevent access of the receptor hmm. to exogenously infecting uh, retroviruses. So it has become an antiviral gene. Uh, there's another a really cool one that, that uh, Jonathan Stoy's group cloned called FV1. Uh, FV1 also gives mice resistance to MLV. Uh, when, they clo- when they identified and cloned FV1, it turned out to be the GAG gene of an endogenous virus. So, so this is the, the gene that encodes the structural, uh, the capsid core that goes around retroviruses. It's an ancient endogenous retroviral GAG gene. Uh, and uh, even though they cloned it back in the 90s, it, it's still not clear how it works. But it, what it does is sometime very soon after an MLV gets into a cell or a retrovirus gets into a cell, uh, this endogenous GAG protein inhibits uh, downstream steps in the viral replication cycle. But we don't have any such restrictions based on our endogenous viruses that we know of at least, right? Yeah, I would say that we don't know of any. It's possible that they exist, though. So why is it that we don't make uh, viruses from these endogenous copies, whereas mice and chickens and maybe some other species do? Is it just random or, or is there a reason? You know, I'm not sure I have a good answer for that. Why aren't there functional human endogenous viruses? I mean, the viruses, the, the viruses that we have are all broken in some fashion. Right? Oh, well, right? you know, before we actually, let me get back to the last, what we were just mm-hmm. talking about, because the other, the neat example, and, and humans includes one, is where uh, endogenous viruses have been turned into some cellular function. Uh, and there's a really neat story, in, mm-hmm. both in humans and mice, and they're, they evolved independently, where there's uh, genes or proteins that are called syncytins. Um, and these are proteins that drive, I'm not going to get all of this right because it's not my field, but they drive uh, the fusion of trophoblast cells to form sort of a mega syncytial trophoblast around the placenta. Uh, and they're involved, these, this, um, this mm. sort of mega cell is involved in the exchange of nutrients between the mother and the fetus. And it's now thought that in humans, a couple of the proteins that are involved in driving the fusion of those cells are actually the envelope proteins of an ancient endogenous retrovirus. Oh, wow. and, and, and that's cool because when you yeah. think about it, that's what an envelope protein of a virus does. It mm-hmm. drives the fusion of two membranes. Mm-hmm. In this case, instead of driving fusion of a virus in a cell, it's driving fusion of two cells. Um, mm-hmm. And it, what's even more amazing is they've identified similar genes in mice, they're not the same genes. So it seems to have evolved independently in humans and in mice as a way of, um, of driving this process of mm. syncytial trophoblast formation. So getting back to Rich's question, which, please repeat it. <laughs> uh, yeah. Oh, so, so uh, the human viruses are all broken. broken Is that right? right? Yeah, in the sense that, as far as we know, none of them will make a completely infectious virus, no. Right. And is there, I think you said something earlier about 
um, these things uh, it, being a driving force in evolution to some extent or something like that, impacting on evolution. I mean, certainly they can be mutagenic. Right. Yes. So I can think they also be, you know, assist in transposition of of domains or whatever. To what extent are they involved in evolution? Yeah. So I, I should be careful how I word that because I, I think what I what I meant is retroviruses in general okay. uh, can certainly be a selective force in evolution, not necessarily endogenous sequences once they've already formed, but the retroviruses okay. themselves. Okay. Um um, and I say that because because that's getting back to something I pointed out in the beginning, that if you look at animal genomes, there's hundreds of thousands of these proviruses. And if you multiply that across the whole animal kingdom, you're talking about tens or hundreds of millions of these. We consider them fossil re retroviruses, actually. Mm -hmm. And so that means that throughout the course of the last 50 to 100 million years of evolution, there's just been... Uh, you know, transmission after transmission, epidemic after epidemic of retroviruses, you know, that, that basically tell us that the, the current AIDS epidemic is just, you know, just a tiny chapter at the end of several volumes of a history that, that's involved many, many, many such epidemics. Well, and in um, terms and, of um, driving evolution, that what you were just talking about is, I, I think, relevant, where you've got a case where we've essentially scrapped a virus for parts. Yes, that's true. They provide fodder mm -hmm. for new evolution, new sequences that can be used. Um, they probably, you know, when they insert, they can sometimes, if they're not detrimental, if they don't kill the host or prevent it from reproducing, sometimes they can create new novelties that natural selection can act on. Right. Um, I think there's a few examples out there, and I'm, I'm not sure how well they've been nailed down, uh, where the LTRs of endogenous retroviruses, for example, have because they're promoters for expressing retroviral genes, when they land in the genome, they could be co-opted as promoters for um, cellular genes too. Mm -hmm. And in such, in in that way, they could change, say, the uh, different tissues that a gene is expressed in. And um, there's a lot of ideas like that out there. They're just they're sort of outside of a mouse or a laboratory animal. They're hard to prove. So we act, we think that in our you know we have a view of our lifetime. And we look at the AIDS epidemic, which began in the early 19, where the virus emerged, at least in the early 1900s. And we don't think much beyond that. But th what you said is striking me that there have been waves of retrovirus infections over thousands and thousands of years. Yeah. And we don't think about that, really, because we're focused on the present. What we see, oh, yeah. we have AIDS, we have HDLV1. But yeah, that's a good point that they've probably come and gone. So they let your ref, what, we're, what we're calling HIV today could land in a germline somewhere. Sure. Yeah. yeah. Actually, you guys have, um, I think at some point you guys did talk about the. the I'm trying to remember acid. that, I think. Yeah. Uh, we talked about the endogenization of koalas. That's right. Yeah. Do you know but about I, that? Yeah. That's, that's kind of an interesting story because it seems to be going on even as we, it's actually happening in real time, so to speak. Mm -hmm. It's the only one we know of, right? And this is an example where some koalas have the endogenous virus and others don't, and you can watch it spread in the, in the population. They live right? long enough. That's right. That's right. Yeah. Like, um, I think it follows a geographic a gradient. Mm -hmm. I forget if it's koalas towards the north. I think have a lot of the endogenous elements and koalas in the south don't seem to have acquired them yet. Right. And the ones they've or shipped to Japan for zoos all have the endogenous virus because they all that's came right. from the north. Yeah. So that's a good example of what we're talking about, how these viruses can, can enter a germline at any time. We just happen to be lucky and detected that one. Could happen. Yeah. It, it could be happening in other species, you know. We don't look at everything. But that is really interesting. Your um, So your postdoc work, Part of it, I believe, is using these sequences to construct primate phylogenies, right? The endogenous virus yeah. sequences. Actually, that was my graduate student graduate work. work. That's right. I'm sorry. John Coffin, yeah. I get him mixed up. You know, I, the reason I – maybe I know you have listeners who are thinking of going into science, so I'll, I'll just say that, you know, in science, when we say somebody's an expert, we usually mean that that scientist works on something currently. <laughs> um, <laughs> Um, I'm I'm kind of an expert in endogenous viruses, even though I haven't worked on them in a while, because of a thing called peer review. 
which means that after I finished my thesis and thought I was going to get away from them, uh, editors at journals started tapping me to peer review uh, papers that other scientists had submitted on endogenous viruses. Uh, almost immediately, starting from the time I was a postdoc. So I, without really choosing to, I've stayed on top of the field um, uh, because I, I guess I should... So editors, when they need to evaluate a scientific uh, paper for publication in a journal, they need to find other scientists that have enough expertise that they can evaluate the paper. And so I get to see a lot of things in the endogenous retrovirus field before they're published. Right. Um, I think uh, I think an expert is somebody who knows what's not known <laughs> you know there's there's two kinds of that's there's a modest kinds, expert <laughs> there's two kinds of i don't know there's there's i don't know and there's it's not known okay yeah you know, but if you're not a, an expert you don't know what's not known <laughs> that's a very an expert, you know that's an expert very relevant knows what the boundaries of the knowledge are that's right. That's right. That's what we deal with all the time because we need to think of projects for people in our lab. And when you're a scientist, if you go into a new field, the problem is nobody published papers saying this is what we don't know yet. So you can. Well, I've always thought it. there ought to be an encyclopedia of what's not known. So, <laughs> but, so, so you, you could, could pick... look at you could look it up and, and ask whether <laughs> yeah. anybody knows it. Well, they're all blank and pages. Maybe, maybe you could have a surprise me button on it. You could just randomly <laughs> something. Well, know. what's not known would be a bunch of empty pages. You just have to fold it in. <laughs> <laughs> no, you ought to be able to look up and find out whether anybody knows anything about this or not. Ah, well, that's yeah. different. No, that, that it's a real problem, right? Because nobody publishes negative data, so you don't know if you're pursuing something that somebody else already gave up on, for example. Right. I don't know about that, uh, Welkin. <laughs> the XR, XMRV field seems to be publishing a lot of negative. They do. Data. They do. They do. <laughs> um, I wanted to know how you make phylogenies from these endogenous guys. I think that's an interesting um, hmm. uh, yeah, way to so, do it. Tell us about that. So, so I, you know, evolutionary biologists have known for a while that you could use them as, as sort of markers. If, if you have, so in a simple way, you can use them, say a chimp and a human both share a provirus, but a gorilla does not. Hmm. Then you could say, based on that little bit of information, that the human and the chimp are more closely related than either one is to the gorilla. For example, I mean, it's a very simplistic example, but that's how they can be used. Hmm. Um, but, but what we um, sort of figured out is you could start taking it further than that. Um, and one of the things you can do is based on the fact that there's, you have these two LTRs at either end of the provirus, right? And we know from the study of modern retroviruses that because of the way reverse transcription works, the two LTRs have to be identical at the instant that the provirus is inserted into a chromosome. Uh, that's because the RNA only has one copy, and so both LTRs have to be made from that one copy. But from that moment forward, once an, a provirus lands in the genome, the two LTRs now can start to accumulate mutations, basically at the background mutation rate, and so the two sequences will start to diverge. And so that puts on, that would be sort of analogous to radiocarbon dating that, that allows you to figure out how old the provirus is because you can take the difference between the two LTRs and divide it by a rate of sequence evolution if you have one. Um, so then you can do that. And then you can, you, what we figured out, and I don't know how much detail to go into, but you can take it a step further. And you can actually use the sequences of the LTRs to generate phylogenetic trees by aligning them uh, and then generating the trees. And if, if everything goes according to plan, the two LTRs should be two independent trees of the evolution of the host and they should look the same right. because they're, they're, they're essentially two sequences that would have undergone through the same path of evolution. And, and what we figured out is that if the tree doesn't look like that, then you know that those sequences have been um, altered in some way. They've undergone recombination or gene conversion or something. Um, and so then Jen Hughes, who was a graduate student that followed me into John's lab, actually was able to take advantage of that. And she was actually to able to sort of use that phenomenon to come up with a rate at which uh, homologous sequences spread throughout the genome will randomly recombine with one another. So there's lots of little tricks that they allow you to do uh, to look at how sequences evolve. What's the rate of, of mutation in the LTR? Do you, do you have a, a clock for that? Yeah, um, you know, I'm, I don't remember the numbers offhand, but it's the same as the rest of the genome. So the 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 rate at which the say the human genome accumulates yeah. substitutions is something like 
one and 10 to the ninth per base pair per year or something right. like that. Yeah, it's, pretty, it's very low. So do you have to preserve the sequence of both LTRs accurately in order for that provirus to be uh, active in producing virus? Or can uh, no. one of them, or no. can they drift? They can, they can drift up to a point because after, at the point that it integrates, the LTRs sort of, the two LTRs take on different functions. So okay. the upstream LTR becomes the promoter and enhancers and the downstream has like the polyadenylation sequence and things like that. Okay, so, so I, pieces of both can drift. I th Yeah, I think up to a point that would be fine. Um, and what would happen is in the next round of replication, um, the differences that occurred at one end or the other would get fixed into both. Why is it that the, the endogenous, say, mouse or chicken viruses haven't sustained enough mutations to make them non-infectious? Why are they still... Making well, virus. a lot of them have. So, so mice and chickens have a lot of dead ones okay. like we do. Um, I think, I think that um, it's just that they also have some that are recently active. And eventually, uh, they'll go as well. Yeah, yes, that's right. And it might even also be that maybe a lot of things cropped up in mice because of the history of laboratory mice. Sure. And they're heavily yeah. inbred, and people were looking for things. They were breeding mice to have high levels of lymphoma, for example, so right, that they could right. study cancer and. So, that, so there may have been, some of it might have been the consequence of experimental manipulation. A few million years from now, it may be the other way around. And the mice yeah. may be asking why, uh, <laughs> why the humans <laughs> have so many active viruses, and they don't. That's right. So the, it, what's here, interesting indeed. is that this, uh, this new human retrovirus, XMRV, probably is originated from an endogenous murine retrovirus, right? That's right. And maybe right. In, in a million years, it'll endogenize humans. Yeah, it could be starting already. Could be starting right. because we don't know how many people are infected, right? I, we don't even know where it's coming from. Yeah. That's that's the most um, puzzling thing to me. That's the thing I wish somebody would figure out. So I think the, uh, the voicemail you sent us was about immunodeficiency viruses. Is that right? Do I remember that correctly? I probably uh, the, did. The, <laughs> the ape immunodeficiency viruses. I'm wondering if any of those have endogenized yeah there's a there's um uh there's a great story there so so rob gifford who's over he's near you now he's at aaron diamond uh okay. and and his colleague eris uh Katsurakis. i apologize eris I, i'm sure i said that wrong uh, but they found actually they found two so they they first found the the very first example of an endogenous lentivirus in european rabbit genomes so lentiviruses are the uh, the genus of retrovirus that HIV-1 uh, and the different SIVs belong to. And so they found the rabbit endogenous lentivirus, and then probably within a year, they found an endogenous primate immunodeficiency virus, so a virus that's actually in the same group as HIV-1 and HIV-2. And I think you've talked about it on the show, but they found that in the genome of the gray mouse lemur. Right which is a primate that lives on Madagascar, about 250 miles off the African coast. Um, and, and that it's, it's uh, I think they estimated it's probably at least 5 million years old or older, so it's, it's degraded. But it's very clearly related to the modern SIVs. Um, it has the same uh, it has sequence identity. It has this sort of the same genome structure. Um, and that the the fact that it's there on Madagascar raises some really um, um, almost unanswerable questions at this point. Yeah, that's um, because they're isolated from the mainland, have been so for millions of years, right? Yeah. And so how did the how did this lentivirus get there? And that lentivirus is not found in other primates on the mainland, right? It's not found. I, in you know, I don't, I don't know if we know that yet, mm. because you, you mean an endogenous SIV? Yeah. yeah. Um, because for whatever reason, in all the genome projects, there's not a lot of the African primates that have been done, other than um, uh, things like chimpanzee. Right. But I think a lot of the African monkeys actually haven't had genome sequences done yet, which is mm. really unfortunate because they're. Um, yeah. They're extremely interesting to AIDS researchers because they get these viruses, but they don't develop the disease. Yep. Um, and probably somewhere in some of their genomes, the answer to why that is hmm. 
probably be found if we knew what we we're looking for. Well, and that lineage is also pretty interesting because where we come from. Yes, yes. Um, the um, so I I think they might still be there. I think if one were to go in uh, with PCR or Southern Bot or something like that and start looking, there might be endogenous lentivirus sequences, say in African mm. monkeys or Sudi mangabees. It'd certainly be worth taking a look. But that's the old-fashioned way. You can't just sit down at a computer and do it. Yeah, yeah. You have to get the specimen, but then eventually you can sit down and and look at it. Yeah. Now, when you had uh, when we corresponded some time ago and discussed what you were going to talk about, you had said herbs would be good because you understood that the list of endogenous viruses was about to grow longer. Yes. So uh, in the last two weeks, a paper came out uh, from uh, Taylor, Leach, and Bruin. Phyloviruses are ancient and integrated into mammalian genomes. And so yeah. this is a, the phyloviruses, of course, are, are not retroviruses, but yet these guys found in a, in a variety of species, they found in the genomes of bats, rodents, shrews, tenrex, and marsupials. I don't know what a tenrec is. Do you, Dixon? No. Never heard of it. They found um, uh, endogenous hedgehog. hedgehogs. Hedgehogs, okay. I think. Somebody better look at it. Yes. <laughs> yes, it is a hedgehog. There you go. So Off with his head. They found uh, phyloviruses. <laughs> and Tenrecidae. They're, they're found in Madagascar and parts of Africa. Uh, so oh. phyloviridae, of course, are Marburg and Ebola viruses. Mm -hmm. And uh, they had originally found the sequence by just mining the genome, and then they looked by PCR and found specific uh, elements, not the entire genomes. Interesting. Uh, mainly one or two viral protein coding regions. And I, w I wondered if you could... Give us your wisdom about some of this, Welkin. Um, I made a couple of notes here. So they found these these genes. I don't have a lot of wisdom to give. Yeah, it's a, I'm sure you have more than we do. Some <laughs> elements are collective wisdom here is less than yours. So here's one that you would you would know. Some elements are transcribed and encode a protein that can interfere with viral assembly. So that's sort of like the story you were saying, uh, where the uh, the endogenous. Sequences in mice can interfere with infection with other retroviruses, I suppose. Yeah, I, I, when I read that, I wasn't, sh it wasn't clear to me that they actually knew that that it was expressed. No, they just I found mean, when, RNA. When I say right. expression, I usually mean protein. Protein, yeah. They just found RNA. They found RNA. So, so, but that doesn't mean that at some point it wasn't expressed. So it might sure. have been. Well, they also raised the possibility that maybe small RNAs derived from them are involved. That's true. And that's cool. That's true. Uh, they show that these results indicate that the direction of transfer is from virus to mammal. And I don't know how. Do you understand how that would be determined from these results? Uh, yeah, I think so. So what, they're, I, so what they're saying, what they're trying to rule out is it's not the other way around. Is mm -hmm. this a mammalian gene that, that viruses acquired right. uh, from their hosts or something like that? And I think it's it's much more likely the way they the other way around that the virus inserted the gene simply because in most cases you don't see it there they found mm -hmm. it in a handful of uh, animals but if you look at related animals um, you'll see the chromosome is there without the insert yes they say in fact eutherians other than bats rodents and insectivores are underrepresented in taxa with integrated phyloviruses so that's what you mean that it's not in all um, of these animals. I didn't know what a eutherian was. Did you know what an insectivore was? Well, I know that. Okay. <laughs> but it's, a, not an, it's not a mammal that eats insects. <laughs> it's not? <laughs> no. What is it? No, these are like echidnas and those sorts of things, like platypus. These are very, very isolated organisms that have uh, no placental reproduction. I see. They're very interesting animals, uh, found so mostly in they... Australia. Why are they called insectivores? That's a good question, actually. <laughs> no, it's a good question. I, I don't know the answer to that, but I know it's not because they eat insects. <laughs> so they, they, looking at the phylogeny... I bet you one of our listeners knows I'm the answer. Sure. <laughs> so they say, looking at the phylogeny, suggests that phyloviruses are tens of millions of years old. A clear indicator of antiquity is the centinous genomic location of a rat yeah. and mouse phylovirus-like, they call these nerves, non-retroviral integrated RNA viruses. So welcome. Why? What is syntony, and why, so, if it's in so, the same in the rat and mouse, does that mean it's old? So syntony is a, a fancy way of saying that it's in the same exact chromosomal location in two species, 
And so usually when you see that, there's two ways that could happen. One could be that uh, at two different times in evolution, two different viruses integrated into exactly the same spot, and that's very highly improbable. Okay. So when you see the same sequence in the same place, what it implies is that the, the original integration event took place once, and it must have been a common ancestor of the two species. And so if they, what was the two they saw it in? It was rats, a, a rat and mice. rats and mouse. Yeah. So if, if, it's, if you have one inserted sequence and it's shared between the rat and the mouse, that means it had to have happened in a common ancestor of rat and mouse. And so based on other data that tell us, people have estimated that rats and mice are, say, between 10 and 20 million years. I see. Diverge from that common ancestor. Oh, interesting. It means that philo filoviruses must have been around at least... Good. 10 million years ago. Um, and, you know, that's actually, um, can I elaborate on it? Yeah, of course. That's an important point because there's there's um, there's kind of a paradox that, that um, people like Eddie Holmes talk about when you study RNA viruses. They have this very high rate of evolution. If you study HIV and re replicating in a person, the sequences change very quickly. Um, and yet, you can look at endogenous retroviruses, modern retroviruses that are separated by tens of millions of years of evolution, and you can still tell that they're related to one another. So how is it that, mm -hmm. that something that really should evolve rapidly over the course of, of a couple of centuries could still be recognizable after millions of years? And so I think people have, have um, sort of inappropriately, I guess, looked at RNA evolution and then estimated that the filoviruses, for example, are about ten thousand years old. I think. I think some people say couple them to the to the appearance of agriculture. Right? Yeah. I think they hinted that in the paper. Sure. But now, now you don't have to guess. We actually have a fossil yeah. that's almost definitely that's ten thousand years old. That's a really good point. Yeah, yeah I like that. Um, one other statement they make: more than one endogenization is required to account for the paraphyly of mammals <laughs> and the paraphyly of marsupials with filoviruses. I don't understand that. Do you? I, I was really afraid you were going to ask. You could so say I no. Think, I think what they're referring to, and there's a, I'm looking at the figure in the paper. What they're referring to is if you look at the, uh, it's uh, figure number six. I don't know if, if listeners will be able to see the paper, but they have a figure where they're showing, an, uh, in black, they're showing an evolutionary tree of all the species that they looked at. And then in red, they show those species in which they found filovirus-like sequences. And those species that have the filovirus-like elements are not all clustered together in the same part of the tree. Mm -hmm. They're sort of spread throughout the tree. Mm -hmm. And so there's two ways to explain that. One is they all acquired filovirus-like sequences in a common ancestor, but then as the different species appeared, some of them lost those sequences. I see. The other way to explain it is that the filoviruses came along a little later and le and in infected independently into the different lineages. So I think it was actually kind of a um, uh, I got to be careful how I say this, but maybe not the clearest way to put it. <laughs> and I, I'm not even sure it's really the right term because because you would really you would apply that to one specific insertion event. Mm -hmm. What they're looking at here is, is, is a whole bunch of them. Some species have several, some species just have one or two. Right. Yeah. Well, if uh, Jeremy's listening, Jeremy Bruin, you can always correct us. It's a great paper though. <laughs> um, I'm, I'm just I, skimming the Wikipedia entry on paraphyly, which is completely confusing. <laughs> yeah, I, the guy who wrote the paper wrote the entry. <laughs> so I, I want to correct myself, by the way. Mono, monotremes is what I was thinking about, not insectivores. Oh. So I, I think insectivores actually do eat insects. So please Thank uh, you, Dixon. allow me to uh, mea culpa Shoot. in public. <laughs> sure, no problem. Uh, the last statement they make, which I want to set forth is filoviruses and bornaviruses are the only demonstrated prehistoric non-retroviral RNA viruses. So hmm. we had talked about a paper a while ago on TWIV showing bornaviruses in the genome, bornaviral DNA copies of bornaviral RNA, and now this adds phylos. So they're prehistoric, the only ones we yeah. know of other than retros. It's interesting. So far. Speaking yeah, of Yeah, this really opens the door for people to go back and uh, go ahead and do yeah. similar types of experiments with other genes. It's very interesting in this that the, that the gene that showed up 
almost exclusively, with one exception, is the most abundantly expressed of the filovirus genes at the uh, near end of the of the genome. Okay, so uh, uh, they're thinking among a, well, they, they cite two reasons. One is that it was abundantly expressed, and so it has a greater mm -hmm. chance of being reverse transcribed and integrated. And then the other thing that we already talked about that they just kind of hint at without coming out and saying is that it could have actually had a selective advantage in being uh, basically provide that uh, host with the integration protection against infection by the same virus. Right. I suppose you could yeah. add to that the possibility that other parts of the virus are selected against, that they might be toxic to the cell. That's cells. a possibility too, yeah. I guess before we leave this was one probably question that's in everyone's minds. How do you get a DNA copy of a phylovirus or a bornavirus RNA into the cell when these viruses do not encode reverse transcriptase? And maybe, Welkin, you would like to uh, tackle that. Um, <laughs> I, I hadn't thought about that that much. So the bornavirus, they explained it because they're, they're an RNA virus, but they actually replicate in the nucleus. Yeah. So the bornaviral RNA could get picked up, say, by a line element of reverse transcriptase. Mm -hmm. I'm not sure why a phylovirus RNA would be inside the nucleus. Um, and I actually, uh, not that, I, well, I am trying to avoid the question, but it, it brings up something <laughs> that I thought was missing from the paper or something I would have liked to have seen. When you look at the insertions of these things, uh, you can often get useful information by looking at the sequence immediately next to them. Mm -hmm. Right, so so at the site of insertion, for example, if it was mediated by a line element reverse transcriptase, there's kind of a hallmark of that. You'll see that the sequence around the insertion will be duplicated, for example. And so it would be really nice, I, there might be some hints there if we could, uh, and maybe they put that information into the databases, I don't know, but it would be interesting to look there and see if there's some hint. Did it get in there by some kind of recombinogenic mechanism or does it look like it got picked up by another virus and inserted there? Or was a cell at some point co-infected with a phylovirus and something that provided the reverse transcriptase to it? Yeah, or I suppose, or if somehow the RNA got into the nucleus, got picked up a little bit by whatever transports things back and forth, or maybe during mm. cell division. I really don't have a problem with this. You know, none of this stuff is black and white, okay? The, the cells are pretty sloppy. Yes. Yeah. There's going to be reverse transcriptase around, and like you say, cell division and that kind of stuff. So over time, you know, there's a chance for this kind of stuff to happen. And I'll bet you that when people uh, have a closer look, we're going to find sequences from all kinds of uh, viruses uh, uh, in the genome. This is no, just I, let's look. I'll take that bet. I think you could actually reproduce this in the lab in cell culture. You could take your RNA virus and yeah. you might be able to detect some some integration, even with viruses in the cytoplasm. That well, you work on an RNA virus, Vince. Are you could you... do it, yeah. yeah. You uh -huh. have to design the experiment properly and look, yeah, you infect cells. You find a virus that doesn't kill the cells, right? Right. And Attenuate it. We have some mutants that don't kill, and we could then look in, the, in this cell genome. We've never done that. Sure, it's an easy experiment. Uh -huh. All right, good experiment, uh, Alan. <laughs> <laughs> Well, that's great. That's a nice discussion. And as I figured, we, we're not going to get to uh, other things, but we'll have you back, Welkin, because I'd love to hear about sieves and uh, trims. Oh, yeah. yeah. I'd love to come back. Come back again. Get beat up again. Oh, oh you're no. Okay. You're okay. <laughs> it's like having a committee meeting again. <laughs> <laughs> that's right. You're absolutely right. We ask you, we ask you questions. But yeah, but we're all, at, we're all, you know, we're all students at the com this committee. We are. We that's are. right. And the only difference is, of course, it's recorded and the whole world can listen. <laughs> yeah. I well, try not to think about that. <laughs> yeah, we never do. Uh, let's read a couple of emails. These are always fun. The, f the first one, yeah, everyone's going to enjoy. This is from Derek and Scott. And they write, we are two graduate students from the University of Guelph in Canada studying oncogenic sheep beta retroviruses. And we are big fans of the show. Part of the reason we like the show so much is that we can use it to keep up to date on the latest virology events and, in addition, expand the breadth of our virology knowledge. We will be attending ASV in July, and we hope to see you there at the live podcast. 
P.S. We have put together a few rap songs <laughs> using clips from some of your past podcasts that I think you and the rest of the TWIV crew will enjoy. We put together the songs using Audacity and free rap beats from $20beats.com. So he's got two. They have two of them. I want to play one now, and we'll play the second at the uh, end of the episode. The first one is called... <laughs> I could stop laughing. The T number index by G Unit. <laughs> this week in virology, this week in virology podcast about viruses. Twiv, T W I V. Time that makes you sick. Admiral Vance. Dick de Palmier. <laughs> Vincent Racaniello. I am a virologist. Her her herpes, herpes, thousands and thousands of different viruses. Red 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 who viruses. The Baltimore scheme. The central dogma. I like the dog. The minus strand is the compliment. Hello, great to be here again. Yes, yes indeed. indeed. Pox. <laughs> Science and ego. Well, unless you had a reverse transcript case, right? Your body Your is body under body attack body from attack viruses. viruses. It's the ultimate parasite. Wow. <laughs> Wow. I want to see that movie. <laughs> Sweet. Isn't it great? Yeah. I mean, he had a little, they have too. clips from each of us. That's terrific. I could recognize you, Dixon. Yeah, well, I have a silly laugh. That's and, uh, <laughs> you know. and Alan Dove, yes, indeed. Yes, indeed. Uh, yes, yes, indeed. And Rich Condit, hello. Great to be here. <laughs> Thanks, uh, Derek and Scott. They did you a favor, Vincent. How they so? Did. How they so? didn't make you say the actual name of the virus that they work on. <laughs> <laughs> because the virus, these sheep beta retroviruses are these, and I'm... Oh, I know the name of that, know. yes. J it's like something. Yaxicte or something You're like right. that. You're right, yeah. That's a very that's interesting like, virus, a, It right? must be a Mayan uh, derivative. <laughs> I don't know. By the way, I got to go back for just a second and and tell you that we were talking about the mm -hmm. endogenous retroviruses and where they show up in evolution. There's actually a pox virus that has an endogenous retrovirus. Aha. Uh -huh. Oh, right. you're kidding. Really? A particular endothelial virus in, um, okay. in uh, foul pox virus. Oh, that's great. Actually, you know, there's also um, a herpes virus, Merix virus, has an endogenous that's provirus in its yeah. genome. Great. Fantastic. Okay. Well, then the memes, which have the biggest... Viral genomes must have an endogenous So how, how often virus. do we have to repeat this Jonathan Swift <laughs> yeah. poem? Yeah, right. To make it a point Ad of... infinitum. That's right. <laughs> that's exactly right. Ad infinitum is right. The next email is from the acrophobic antediluvian. <laughs> right. It's the May 25th episode of To The Point podcast from KCRW. Had a segment titled Synthetic Cells... Momentous Breakthrough or Ethical Morass. <laughs> this was a fascinating listen, and to me illuminated a problem that you have discussed before on TWIV, specifically that it is common for science stories to be distorted or sensationalized by the media. Hey, it's a living. <laughs> <laughs> right. <laughs> the, this instance is, however, clouded by the fact that David Baltimore and Craig Venter completely disagreed and had what seemed to me a tense argument. One said a breakthrough in creating life occurred in a laboratory. The other said it really is nothing new and is not a paradigm shift. So whose story do we accept? How should we listen to a conversation like this and decide who is in the right? Should we go by the credentials, number of Nobel Prizes won, etc.? It seems as if the issue is split down the middle. Can you comment? Is there consensus in the scientific community? Are the TWIV hosts on one side of this? I urge you all to listen. So let me play this clip, uh, and then we'll come back and, and have a little chat about this. Uh, David Baltimore is President Emeritus of the California Institute of Technology. He received the 1975 Nobel Prize in Physiology uh, of Medicine for his genetic research. And Professor Baltimore, good to have you back on our program again. Hi, Warren. How are you? Very well, thank you. Uh, you're one of those, I think, who falls into the category that David Biello said earlier, uh, don't think this is that big a deal. Uh, tell us why. Well, I take a long view. Uh, I've been in molecular biology now since 1960, and I've watched us go from first understanding the structure of DNA to understanding the way DNA is handled in cells to being able to synthesize DNA and to uh, move it around from place to place. And I see this as a step in this process. It's an impressive step from a technical point of view, 
because it allowed very large pieces of DNA to be synthesized with sufficient accuracy so that it could reproduce uh, the computer code that they talk about. Um, but conceptually, it is very little different than the synthesis of a viral DNA, which was done a long time ago, um, or for instance, poliovirus DNA, which was synthesized by Eckhart Wimmer and announced a couple of years ago. Uh, they did a bacteria rather than a virus. It's much bigger. It had to go into a bacterial cell rather than replicate as a virus, but it's not conceptually different. different. And as Clyde said, and I have great respect for him and have him for many, many years, um, as he said, uh, they're not even going to really do this very often because it's expensive, complicated, and clumsy. Uh, in fact, you want to start with existing genomes and modify them in appropriate ways, adding genes, subtracting genes, modifying genes, in order to get organisms to do what you want, to make uh, fuels or, or to make uh, vaccines or, to, or, or a lot of other things. And that's a process which has been going on now for a long time. The, the Inventor Institute is a place that has been a pioneer in doing that sort of thing and will continue to be. So I just don't see this as paradigm changing in any way. And I think that by it, it having been blown up uh, so much by the press, and, and I, I partly fault the, the Craig Venter and the Institute for uh, feeding that, um, it has become a, a lightning rod. Let me quickly go back to Clyde Hutchinson because he needs to leave us uh, at the half hour and we only have a minute or so before then. Uh, Professor, how do you respond to that? Uh, not really a paradigm change blown up by the press and by the Venter Institute. Well, I, I think it's, uh, you know, it, whether it's a paradigm change or not it depends on your point of view. I think it's a very critical step in the work toward trying to build life in the laboratory, because it's uh, the first time that we really have a cell where we determine the, the complete sequence that it was going to have and made it from scratch. It proves that the sequence is accurate enough to specify a functional cell. It's kind of like the old days in chemistry when you would... Uh, determine a structure and synthesize it and then see if it has the, the synthetic product has the properties of your original material. It's a verification of the structure. It, it's, it's an analog of that in biology. Uh, I, I think that the way that people engineer bacteria is going to be dramatically affected by the methods was developed. I'm with David. I'm with David. Yeah. Vince used to be with David. <laughs> <laughs> still, still with him. I, I, I agree too. Even though I don't know much about this, I think that uh, having replicated a viral infection from scratch uh, is that was the paradigm shift, and after that, everybody was me tooing, and this sounds like a me tooism, except. <laughs> Yeah, let's make it sure that let's make sure that all the listeners understand exactly what's going on here. The the they uh, from the known genetic code and starting from chemical synthesis of nucleic acid sequences, they assembled the genome of a bacterium. Okay, well, and then yeah. in order to make that into uh, uh, basically a cell, what they had to do was to insert that genome into a living bacterial cell right. that was, in fact, related to the one that the genome came from. And then the, technically the way this is done, if I understand it correctly, is to then inactivate the genome, the pre-existing genome in that cell yeah. so yeah. that the new inserted genome can take over control. And then over time, yeah. all those instructions are executed so that the cell that you have, in fact, is an accurate reflection of the new genome. Right. But the point is that you needed the cell yeah. to stick the DNA into. That's right. 
Okay, you didn't do it from scratch. And if this sounded like a, temp a technical, technically complicated thing to do, it was, and it's a very impressive accomplishment. But it's yeah. kind of like it's kind of like juggling while riding a unicycle. You know, it's a really cool trick, but you're not going to commute to work that way. Hmm. <laughs> Actually, there's an interesting uh, thing that one of the authors on this paper, uh, Hamilton Smith, who himself is a Nobel Prize winner, uh, came to Florida a, f a couple of years ago while this work was in progress and talked about it. And one of the interesting uh, bits is that, uh, technical bits, is that uh, as you handle larger and larger DNA molecules, it becomes more and more difficult to do the ligation steps, to stick them sure, together. Sure, sure. Okay? Right. Yeah, that's right. Uh, and in the end, what they, they found... they snapping back on themselves. Well, it's, they're just hard to deal with. In the end, what they found was that, in fact, they could take... Uh, if I recall this correctly, uh, lots of different, fairly smaller sequences and insert them together into yeast, and the yeast would, <laughs> by analogous recombination, put them together themselves. Yeah. So, in fact, part of the technique is to get another cell right. to help them with the assembly. Yeah. Very interesting. Yep. But they haven't created life in a test tube. No. No, no they no. have not. And nope. it, it, this is technically difficult and extremely expensive. There's no way that this would be used in any routine fashion. Someone will have to work out a better way to do it. So Yeah, there's uh, a better way. It's called restriction enzymes and <laughs> yeah. I mean if you wanna as David said, if you want to make bacteria that can take care of things or make things, you can modify them. Alter the ones that exist. I don't That's think right. you have to make the genome from scratch. In virology we have a similar issue. You know, we can make viruses by putting known DNA sequences into cells, but we can't make a virus from scratch. We don't have any idea how to do that. Right. And so it's a similar thing, on, just on a different scale. So uh, Welkin gave us a link to a, a comment on this from uh, Small Things Considered, from Bernard Strauss, who and we'll post a link to this. And he says, I would argue that the result is of little theoretical importance. The critical mm -hmm. part of Kornberg's work 40 years ago and of Venter's work this year is the necessity of a preformed cell, mm -hmm. referring to DNA replication, the Kornberg result. And then he says at the end, which Rich pointed out, which I like, it is, let's see, where is this? It also prompts us to muse that every virus does something similar with less <laughs> expense and fanfare. <laughs> that's probably Elio or Mary probably wrote that one. That's right, that's right. That's not Bernard. Yeah. That's uh, It's written by Elio and Mary. That's cool. So there you go, uh, acrophobic antediluvian. Uh, great, uh, great email. Great question. That's a good uh, discussion. Yeah, thank you, because we have wondered about talking about it, and we're glad that you uh, brought it up. All right, let's do our picks and wrap up this puppy uh, let's have our guest go first. Welkin. Uh, yeah, so my, my pick is actually a, a slim volume that I picked up at the Cold Spring Harbor uh, bookstore when I was there in May. It's called Advice for, young Invest for a Young Investigator. Uh, it's a book written by the Spanish Nobel laureate Santiago Ramon y Cajal, who was the, I guess, sort of the father of modern neuroscience. Mm -hmm. and, and the title is an English translation. It's a horrible. It makes it sound like the kind of book you'd find in the self-help section of a bookstore. <laughs> but it, it, um, and it was, it was actually written in probably the 1890s, and it was supposed to be advice for somebody launching into a career in science. And I started reading it, and I was just amazed how pertinent it would be to somebody starting in science today. Uh, I highly recommend it. It's actually a funny read. Um, and I just, there's one section in particular that really made me like the book. And it advises uh, people going into science, and this is still true today, not to be preoccupied with applied science. He says, another corruption of thought that is important to battle at all costs is the false distinction between theoretical and applied science. Uh, and he goes on to point out that the course of progress obviously would have suffered if Galvani, Volta, Faraday, and Hertz, who <laughs> discovered the fundamental principles of electricity, had discounted their findings because there were no industrial applications for them at the time. Right. Mm -hmm. I think that's a really good take-home message. So yeah. Yeah. I'll recommend the book based on that. That Excellent. is beautiful. I love Very that. Nice. Yeah, great. I have to pick that up because I like that. We have too much emphasis on translational research these days and not the basic stuff. Apparently it was a problem 100 years ago, too. <laughs> good to know. Good to know that. 
Rich, what do you have for us? I have a New York Times article that my uh, wife showed to me. It's called How Microbes Defend and Define Us by Carl Zimmer. Oh, yeah. Uh, and this is, uh, this is really wonderful. It starts out focusing on a case, which I think could make a twiv all by itself that I'll, I'll try and summarize really uh, quickly. Uh, it describes um, a case of apparently um, a not uncommon outcome of uh, um, antibiotic treatment where you wipe out the intestinal flora is that uh, you can be taken over by a bacterium called Clostridium difficile, which, <clears throat> which causes diarrhea, and it can be difficult to treat. And this describes a case of a uh, woman who had had this uh, disease for eight months, lost 60 pounds, was confined to a wheelchair in diapers, and nothing worked. And so this gastroenterologist performed uh, what he called a fecal transplant. He took 25 grams of uh, feces from her husband and put it in her colon. And within two days, her symptoms had abated. Within two weeks, she was totally cured. Okay. Wow. So he recolonized right. her intestinal tract with the flora from her husband. Not only that, but they took samples from her before and after and samples from her husband and did deep sequencing on them and showed that her flora was completely goofed up uh, uh, before the transplant and that afterwards hers matched his. Okay. The article uses that as a lead in to say that bacteria, you know, are. We live in symbiosis with microbes. Here, here. Okay. And then the article goes on to describe uh, multiple different scenarios that are similar to this. And it's all sort of wound up with our uh, current ability to do this uh, deep sequencing and examine the uh, microbiome and the uh, virome, if you like, uh, to. Uh, in much more detail than we've ever done before. They even point out this human microbiome project. Mm -hmm. That's an NIH funded mm -hmm. thing. That's looking at the microbiome from 18 different sites and 300 volunteers. It's about time, isn't it? Yeah, it's great. And they go, well, you know, the technology is, is just becoming uh, really manageable at this right, point to right. do this. Uh, at one point in this, they come to a conclusion that I really like. They say some scientists argue that these studies all point to the same conclusion. When children are deprived of their normal supply of microbes, their immune systems get a poor education. In some, <laughs> in some people, untutored immune cells become too eager to unleash, uh, too eager to unleash a storm of inflammation. Instead of killing off invaders, they damage the host's own body. Mm -hmm. So this microbial symbiosis, uh, I think, w with us is is really uh, really important, and this article describes it uh, really well. So I, it's a quick read. It's very well right written. Here. I recommend it to anybody. And that's written by Carl Zimmer. Yep. Yep. And Carl wrote a book also on that same topic called Microbes. Excellent. Oh, so will all of those bacteria have viruses? Uh, I'll bet. That's it. I'll bet they have phages that make them help us. Well, yeah, sure. yeah. Without yeah. that system, you'd have no molecular biology, right? In fact, we have a paper queued up for a future TWIV where they just did a sequence, a deep sequencing on the phages of of, uh, of samples from twins, I believe. Uh, yes, Did you uh, see that? Uh, that was pointed out to me the other day. So we'll, I, we'll, I really want to see that. We'll yeah. do that on a future TWIV. But uh, Maybe, uh, yes, welcome. I am sure the bacteriophages make a big contribution to this. So hmm. it's not just the kinds of bacteria, but those lysogenic phages, those endogenous viruses here, here. in the bacteria. <laughs> and colocenes, too. Let's not forget colocenes. Sure. Right. That's an amazing story. I suppose this was IRB approved. Uh, but yeah, I know, he talks. I actually went back and read the uh, original paper, and they they did consent forms and all this kind of stuff. Since that time, apparently, they've done um, uh, another fifteen of these, yeah. and thirteen were successful. Amazing. So that's great. Have they ever done Amazing. animal studies like this, mice or monkeys? Or I don't. Yes. That I don't know. There have been. I, well, I was at a um, a seminar. Uh, with a researcher whose name I've now forgotten, unfortunately, but she was working on exactly this, and one of her model systems was taking mice and uh, uh, essentially sterilizing their gut and then reintroducing uh, various things in various ways. And Do you think that someone will eventually sell 
a you know a bacterial capsule. mixture a capsule that you would take to do this rather than having to use a fecal sample we do uh, well, you could just sell fecal samples. You know, it's hard to avoid. You wouldn't be the first person who'd sold that. I'm going to tell you something now. It's, it's knowing the way the food industry works and the way the <laughs> restaurant industry works, it's hard to imagine us avoiding this, even if we wanted to. <laughs> yeah, but fecal samples, you can imagine, can be so varied, you know, yeah, depending right. on what yeah. you've eaten or what sure. other viruses you've got in there. But, right. you know, Vince, right. this is the whole basis for traveler's diarrhea. I mean, I've, I've been teaching the subject on a larger scale now for many years, and reason why you de develop uh, diarrheal disease when you go to a place like Mexico or Southeast Asia or something like that, they get the same disease when they come here. It's just you, you forgot this big exchange of, of gut flora. Now, that can only happen if we're being constantly bombarded by gut flora <laughs> in the local environments. And it's, it's easy to just go around and swipe all these uh, items that you come in contact with every day and isolate virtually every single species of bacteria that you can find in your gut tract. So, I worked at Notre Dame in, in the germ-free animal department, right? And so that, that starts out with no bacteria and then adds them back one at a time and then just to see what happens. We're on another podcast call this week in parasitism and I, can, I have a good story for that show in which the eggs of Trichuris will not hatch unless they've come in contact with bacteria in the gut tract of its host. Now that's pretty special stuff because up to this point we figured that these parasites are in competition with all these microbes in the gut tract and it turns out they're in collusion with them rather than competition they all need each other in order to succeed and of course they need us for them to succeed so not a, not a lot of pathogens kill us but they certainly um, limit our functions for them uh, when it comes to their uh, own functions at any rate, that's that's. I'm sorry to mix apples and bananas no, here. No, but it's okay. <laughs> it's all part of the same scene, it's right? It's okay. Alan, what do you have? Uh, my pick is the Crystal Set Society, and I, I searched through the TWIV archives because I thought I must have picked this before, um, but it looks like I haven't. Um, and these are folks. It's a it's an online community of people who are into building their own radios, and I don't mean from kits. I mean they're building. The, they do have kits, but they. A lot of them are building these things from um, from scraps, you know, bits and pieces mm -hmm. you would find in the garbage, um, and they have a lot of cool projects and and ideas and plans and books on the site, um, and uh, it's it's fun to me because one of the first sciency or technolo technological things that most people experience at some point is building a crystal radio. Yeah. Um, you know, just just about everybody I know who's gotten into technology <laughs> and science has at some point had an encounter with one of these things. It doesn't use any batteries. You put it together out of a few wires. You put the earphone in your ear, and you can hear radio stations. Mm. And it's just That's one a... of those really cool, you know, things that uh, that you can assemble out of scrap parts and uh, and tap into something um, really amazing. Mm. Yeah, this this would great. be good for kids' uh, science fair at school. Exactly. Next year. Yes. How about, Absolutely. That? How about that? I was thinking the same thing. Alan, do you know uh, this guy, the physicist Feynman, Richard yes. Feynman? Yes. Sure. Do you know how he started? He grew up in Brooklyn. He grew up fixing radios. Right. <laughs> <laughs> and that got him interested in science. That's 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 his own story. The Crystal Set Society. Well, we'll have to make the Virus Society and. Have people build their own viruses from scratch? <laughs> yes, that's not a paradigm shift, Vince. I'm sorry. <laughs> no, it's just cool, though. It's all right. <laughs> uh, uh, Dixon, do you have yes. a, a pick for us? I have a pick, but I I haven't got the exact uh, reference. Uh, it's the paper that recently came out that was featured in Science News by Peter Palais, uh -huh. which has uh, given a function to the missing protein in the Spanish flu strain, which did not induce interferon. And as the result, <clears throat> the Spanish flu virus strain of influenza had a higher rate of mortality than local strains of, uh, of virus now. And uh, we've discussed this at, uh, off the record. And um, you agree that they've known about this protein for a while, but now we know what the protein does. And that's the, uh, the very recent article. I think it's Less than two months old, if I'm not mistaken. I think that's the, you're referring to the PB1F2. I am. Which is encoded in a second open reading this frame. This is correct. Yeah, and which is absent in last year's pandemic uh -huh. strain and uh, present in some of the other 
pandemic strains 1918 for right, one right, right, and right now i think yeah you're right he's discovered the function it seems to be an interferon antagonist right yeah Which so is we'll, so interesting we will find the link to that and put it in and my pick is a very nice graphic from the iavi the international uh, aids vaccine initiative which is a nonprofit organization it's from their july 2010 issue it is a beautiful graphic called antibodies in the quest to develop an hiv vaccine and it basically shows uh, how antibodies work to neutralize infectivity and this is motivated i think by a recent description of some antibodies to hiv which apparently can uh, neutralize a wide range of hiv strains so it's a really cool graphic and that's a story we'll probably cover on a future twiv looks great it's a really it really is a nice graphic yeah, i got it sitting here yeah, yeah it's a pdf everyone can get it check it out and that'll do it for another twiv there are many ways that you can listen to us at the itunes store it's free of course the zune marketplace and if you do use those try subscribing it's free and lets you get automatically each new episode you can also listen to us with stitcher radio you can find that at bit.ly slash stitch twiv that's a free app for your smartphone that allows you to listen on the go without downloading you can always play or download the episodes at twiv.tv where we also have show notes and all the links that we mention if you like twiv please tell others about it links and reviews in itunes are particularly helpful TWIV is part of microbeworld.org, sciencepodcasters.org, and promednetwork.com, websites where you can find high-quality science content. As always, send us your questions and comments to TWIV at TWIV.tv. Welkin, thanks for joining us. My pleasure. Welkin's at Harvard Medical School and at Small Things Considered. And we'll have you back soon to talk about trims and sieves. Oh, I'm looking forward to it. Great. Alan Dove, thank you. Always a good time. AlanDove.com is where you can find what's on Alan's mind. <laughs> Rich Condit is at the University of Florida, Gainesville, home of the Fighting Gators. There you go. <laughs> <laughs> right. Not just the Gators. Not yes. the Fighting Gators. The Gators are the alligators in the water. The Fighting Gators <laughs> are those guys down there. Thanks, <laughs> Thanks for coming back. Always, always a good time. And Dixon de Palmier. Pleasure to come good back. Good to see you again, Dixon. We miss you. Come by more often. I will. You know, you're welcome yeah. anytime. I do know that. <laughs> I'm sorry. I've you... got a pick for you, actually, Dick. That, uh, uh -oh. If I'd have known you were going to be here, I would have queued it up, but this one was too timely. But I'm not going to tell you. you we got to come back. <laughs> you have to come back, okay? Oh, uh, sure. I'll be back. I'll be back next week, but Vince won't. I know where he's going to be. I'll be in Bozeman. And in fact, thank you for the cue, Dixon. We'll be in Bozeman, Montana. We're going to do TWIV at the American Society for Virology. That's Tuesday, July 20th at noon in the Student Union Building. And get this, the name of the hall is the Procrastinator <laughs> Theater. Love it. Love so it. I guess we'll never get it done, right? Well. <laughs> so if you're at ASV, come by and check it out. And, and don't be put of off by the name of the theater. Don't exactly. be put off. You've been listening to This Week in Virology. <laughs> Thanks for joining us. We'll be back next week. Another TWIV is viral. This week in virology. SV40. SV40. In either the inactivated or the infectious uh, polio vaccine. The kind that make you sick this week in this virology week, this virology week in virology i'm going to take you to get the uh, pandemic next week okay what is this vincent drac in yellow what is this what is this Acta retracta. run with it baby <laughs> <laughs>